I'm now going to talk about Roger van der Weyden or Roger van der Weyden or Roger de la Pasteur, which is the French version of his name. Um, he, with Jan van Eyck, are considered to be the founders of early Netherlandish painting. And then I'm going to talk about an artist who uh, seems to have a workshop relationship with Roger van der Weyden, uh, Hans Memlink. And I suppose I should warn students that I did write my dissertation on Hans Memlink. Um, this is the first work we're going to talk about by Roger van der Weyden. It is uh, considered to be one of his early works as an independent artist uh, outside his workshop. We do have a number of documents uh, dealing with uh, his master, Robert Campine. And so we even know when Roger got his mastership. Um, what do we know about Roger? Well, we know that he died in 1464, and we think that he was born about 1400 or 1399. He was 64 when he died. He was trained in Tournai uh, with the master, was Robert Campine, and he moved to Brussels where he became the town painter of Brussels. So you'll remember that Jan van Eyck was a court painter. Roger van der Weyden is painting for the town, so it's, um, it's different patronage. Now, what Roger is particularly known for is his invention. Max J. Friedlander, who was uh, the great connoisseur of early Netherlandish painting, um, he said that Jan van Eyck was an explorer, but Roger van der Weyden was an inventor. In other words, Jan van Eyck explored the visible world and recreated it um, in minute detail. Roger van der Weyden created compositions and gestures that other artists could copy and adapt. Now, I should let you know, there's no copyright in the 15th century. So many artists borrow from other artists. We have examples where Roger van der Weyden borrowed from Jan van Eyck. But some artists copy particularly from certain artists, and Roger van der Weyden is one of those. It would be very hard to get that perfect technique of uh, Jan van Eyck and to copy that with the layers and layers of oil glazes and the luminosity and the precise detail. And, and people do copy it generally. But they could more easily perhaps copy a composition, even if it's not exactly the same, you know, uh, it still has compositional elements. So Roger van der Weyden is very well known for certain uh, compositions. Uh, for example, he painted a nativity in which the Madonna, in which Mary, the Virgin Mary, has her hands pressed together in what we recognize as a prayer gesture, but instead of having it pointed upward, the hands point downward to the Christ child, and that draws attention to the Christ child. That's just an example. We'll see some other things here. Now, something else about Roger is he has extremely strong emotional content. Uh, he's known for painting the suffering of Christ and to showing um, the agony and the suffering of Christ and his followers. And another thing we're going to see is his very strong design sense. He has these patterns and arrangements of the shapes and the lines, and they're all extremely naturalistic. But if you were, let's say, a modern abstract artist, you could almost take out the figures and you know, leave the compositional elements and still have you know, a wonderful composition. Well, let's look at some of that. We're looking at the descent from the cross 
or sometimes called the deposition, which comes from the Latin term uh, deposito. But it's, it's Christ being taken down from the cross after the crucifixion. And you'll notice that the figures on each end, one is uh, this figure in red, it's uh, St. John, is leaning over almost like a parenthesis. And on the opposite side, on the right side, uh, there's Mary Magdalene uh, wringing her hands. Of course, this is one of these gestures that gets copied. But there is uh, Mary Magdalene wringing her hands and also leaning over, once again, like a parenthesis on uh, one side to enclose the composition. You'll also notice, and we'll talk more about this, but that Christ is held in a particular position, and Mary has fainted, and she is in exactly the same pose. So you have this, you know, repetition of the forms. The background of this is, is a little unusual. It's, it looks like a gold box. It's a very compressed space. Um, and the figures are made up. There are some curving spaces, but a lot of them are angular. There's the you know, angles of elbows and knees and sharply breaking folds. And that increases the feeling of tension, uh, of suffering. Now, why this sort of golden box are they created in? Well, it has been suggested that this work of art, of painting, uh, has some relationships to other types of art. It's been uh, compared to a schnitz altar or a carved wooden altarpiece that has been painted. So um, if you would have a carved altarpiece, you would have the figures uh, carved in wood with this kind of uh, background where you would have a little wooden box, which could be painted gold. And so it's as though the carved figures have come alive in a sense, only of course they're painted. Um, another parallel with um, another form of art is theater or drama. And of course at this time, um, the theater, the dramas were uh, miracle plays, mystery plays, they were religious plays. And sometimes they would do a, what we call a tableau vivant, a living painting, quite literally. And the figures, the, the people who were acting the parts, uh, you know, could take a pose and hold it, say, over the lamentation of the body of Christ or the crucifixion. And so in a way, this is what the painting looks like, as though these figures are, are frozen in space and, and compressed um, with some kind of uh, background, backdrop, in this case, more like a little schnitzel for box, perhaps. So whatever the references, um, it intensifies the motion and it focuses on the figures within the work. We said we have the rhythmic uh, composition where you're repeating the forms of Christ and Mary, uh, the parentheses of John and the Magdalene. Uh, but if you look at some of the other details, um, you might see, for example, the hem of uh, the, the figure in brocade, who is uh, Nicodemus, and how the edge of his garment curves around. Uh, and there's a similar curve to the, the um, uh, winding cloth behind Christ, or uh, generally the way Mary's garment comes down, and yet you know Mary's garment is broken into all this myriad of little angular shapes. We talked about Mary and Christ having the same pose, and we talked about that as though it is a compositional device. Well, it is, but it also has a further meaning. It refers to a theological concept of Mary as co-redeemer or co-redemptrix. Now, how does that work? Well, when we look at this image, we see that Mary is in exactly the same pose, the same position as Christ. And this idea, which was 
and is not yet a doctrine. Uh, people didn't have to believe it, but most people did believe it. Uh, that Mary participated in the salvation of mankind. Now, she does that several ways, just by bearing the Christ child. Now, if Mary had not uh, given birth to Christ, according to Christian theology, you know, mankind could not be saved. But during the Middle Ages, they went further. And they had an idea, which was called the treasury of merits. And I, I guess you could call it an analogy. Um, but it was talking about salvation. And the analogy was to a treasury. We would think about it as a bank. And for example, if it were money, um, you know, if you had some very wealthy person who put huge amounts of money in a bank and said, anybody can come and draw from it what they need. You know, if you need to pay your rent, you can come and, and take this money out. Um, well, it wasn't money. It was merits. And of course, the Christian belief is that Christ's sacrificial death made possible the salvation of mankind. That human beings weren't good enough to save themselves. But God himself, because I see Christ as part of the Christian trinity, uh, sacrificed himself in order to create merits that the faithful could draw upon. So the treasury of merits, if you think of it, is a kind of bank of uh, the merits of Christ. You know, all of this suffering that he didn't deserve any of it. And yet, you know, it, it created merits. It created um, the possibility of salvation. Well, they started thinking there were other people who suffered so much more than they deserved for their faith. The saints, maybe a little bit. You know, they were human, so they were sinners. But Mary, now the idea had come that Mary was sinless. That in order to bear the Christ child, she had to be given a kind of dispensation to be born without original sin. So that when Mary was conceived, she did not, she was the only fully human being that did, did not have the original sin of Adam and Eve. And so the idea grew up that she had never sinned. And so all of the suffering that she felt was also completely undeserved. And the idea was Mary suffered with Christ. She suffered in her heart. She suffered in her soul as he suffered on the cross. And this makes merits. All of that undeserved suffering, you know, can go into the treasury of merits. Now, Christ's merits are enough. That's enough to save all of mankind. But I guess you expect... Ex I guess you could consider it extra merits um, that are in this treasury. So that Mary's merits can also be called upon, that, um, that she can also, by her suffering and her participation in Christ's sacrifice, help to save mankind. She can't do it herself. She's co-redeemer. Actually, in images of the crucifixion, or here, the descent of the cross, we usually see Mary portrayed in two ways. Either the stabat mater, which means the standing mother, and there is a medieval hymn uh, by that name, who stands erect in her faith under the cross, or the suffering mother, which we see here, where Mary suffers so much that she completely swoons. You know, she, she can't even stand. And here we're looking at some more details. You see uh, the face of the dead Christ uh, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea holding his head, Nicodemus holding his feet. Now, when we look closer at this, we see something that we've never seen in the history of art, at least in surviving works of art. 
you'll notice that Mary, Nicodemus, and other figures have tears coursing down their faces. Their eyes overflow with tears and these these um, droplets, these crystalline droplets, uh, you know, drip down their faces. Podovsky said that these were the first tears in the history of art. Now, could there have been some Roman or Greek painter who painted tears? Certainly there could have. Uh, we know Apelles painted water droplets on the body of Venus rising from the sea. But we don't have a literary source that says that any artist from ancient Rome or from ancient Greece painted tears. And we don't know of anything that exists earlier. I, at least I don't. Um, there is a painting by Robert Campine, Roger van der Weyden's master uh, in London and the Courtauld Institute, in which it's, it's a um, lamentation or, or a entombment, and uh, followers of Christ are weeping. There's an angel wiping their eyes, uh, very much like one of the holy women in uh, Roger van der Weyden's Descent from the Cross. So when I went to London, I went and I looked because I wanted to see specifically, could we see any tears? And none are visible. So, as far as we know, this is the first time that we're seeing tears in the history of art. And that, of course, shows the suffering, so shows the pain. Also, I want to point out uh, that Roger van der Weyden, like Jan van Eyck and other Netherlandish masters, is so interested in uh, the details. Here you see the stubble of the beard on Nicodemus and uh, the fur that you know looks like Fur. So um, we can continue to talk about Netherlandish naturalism. Now we're going to look at another painting by Roger van der Weyden. This one is St. Luke drawing the Virgin Mary. And this painting is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Now, St. Luke, uh, the author of the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, was believed to be a physician. And he became the patron saint of painters and physicians because of a legend, the legend that said that St. Luke painted a portrait of the Virgin Mary. Now, we call it a legend. They would have called it a fact. And you'll see, one of the things that's really interesting about this is there is Mary uh, nursing the Christ child. And the saint is kneeling in front of her, drawing. He's not painting, like the legend says. He's actually drawing the Virgin's portrait in a technique known as silver point. Uh, and silver point is when you have a specially prepared paper and you draw on it with a stylus that's tip is uh, silver. And so when you draw on the paper, you actually aren't seeing what you're drawing. So you have to have you know, very precise skill. But the silver that's deposited oxidizes and makes this uh, very fine line. Now, why did he show Luke drawing the Virgin rather than painting the Virgin? Probably because that was the actual workshop practice of the time. You know, if you're a really important person, not like the Duke or a really busy person, like a merchant who wants uh, your portrait painted, you're probably not going to want to sit there while the artist, who's of a lower social class, uh, paints your portrait. We know in later times, uh, people would do this. You know, the artist would work from life. But in the 15th century, the artist would make a very detailed drawing of the features of the person uh, he was going to portray. And then he would probably take color notes and take that drawing back to his studio where he would paint the finished portrait. We actually have a drawing 
of the Cardinal Albergati by Jan van Eyck and the corresponding painting. And on the drawing, he has color notes. He says, you know, he's got a ruddy complexion, for example. So this would have been the actual practice um, rather than what we see in later years uh, when someone will actually just sit for the artist. Another interesting thing about this painting is it has been suggested that St. Luke is a self-portrait of Roger van der Weyden, that he's showing himself in the guise of the patron saint of painters. And the evidence for this is um, a portrait, uh, a drawing, that is in this book of drawings. It's called the Codex Aris because it's a codex or book in Aris, uh, the town. Uh, and it contains drawings of famous people. Uh, and in it we see some artists. Uh, one of them is Roger van der Weyden. Another one is Hieronymus Bosch, and uh, they're named. And it does bear some relationship to this uh, portrait. Um, there's also a copy, uh, a tapestry actually, uh, that is supposed to be made after a painting by Roger van der Weyden. The painting's lost. Uh, and in it, it has a figure that is supposed to be a portrait of Roger van der Weyden. And he has this, you know, similar features, this long face, for example. So we're not 100% sure, but there is certainly the possibility that Roger used his own features uh, to create his image of the patron saint of painting. So in one way, he's calling upon um, the saint to you know, work through him. He is following the example of the paint, painter, the painter, painter saint. Um, you know, he's taking on his guise, as it were. Now, this was a very popular painting. As we're going to see, it was copied a number of times. And one of the possibilities is that, that it was the altarpiece for the Guild of St. Luke. And this was the Guild of the Physicians and Apothecaries and Painters. Okay. In the Netherlands, if you were going to be a professional painter, you just didn't you know, pick it up somewhere or go to art school. You would be apprenticed to an artist and you would have to go through you know, all the different steps. You might remain an apprentice. You might become a journeyman. Or in a very few cases, you would become a master of the painter's guild. Well, all of the different crafts had guilds, and these were organizations um, of craftsmen who bonded together for a variety of reasons uh, to protect their trade, um, to uh, maintain the high standards of the guild. Uh, you weren't allowed to go from one town to another to sort of hawking your wares. Uh, you had to be a member of the guild in that particular city. Um, they also had spiritual benefits. Uh, they would usually have a chapel in which uh, masses would be said, prayers would be said, and uh, you know a funerary uh, fund so that when someone died, masses could be said for their souls um, uh, and they could be buried properly. So there were responsibilities and there were protections uh, through this guild or uh, corporation. Now, we said that this was the Physicians, Apothecaries, and Painters Guild. In different towns, uh, they might be arranged slightly differently, but it was fairly frequent that the physicians, the apothecaries, and the painters were all in the same guild. Why? Well, a couple of possibilities. One, they were, in a sense, all chemical workers, as we would say. Um, the apothecaries, uh, you know, of course, would you know create medicines from uh, different herbs that they would grind up, uh, and of course, the the physicians uh, would possibly use some of those in their medicinal practice. 
And where did the painters get their pigments? They'd go to the apothecary. Uh, and that's where they would buy many of their pigments. But there's probably another reason, and that is St. Luke. If St. Luke was both a physician and a painter, it was appropriate to both the painters and physicians to be in the same guild. Now, I mentioned that artists borrowed from each other, that they were influenced by each other. And in this case, we can see that a master painter, Roger van der Weyden, was indeed influenced by another very famous uh, painter, Jan van Eyck. And you can see uh, the painting by uh, Jan van Eyck, which is on your right. Uh, it's known as the Roland Madonna or the Madonna of Chancellor Nicholas Roland. And uh, there is the Chancellor of Burgundy uh, kneeling. And uh, the Virgin Mary is appearing to him uh, with the Christ child uh, who blesses him. You'll notice that uh, Roland is, has his book of hours open, probably the little office of the Virgin. And as he says his devotions, um, the Virgin appears. She becomes present. You'll also notice the setting and the background. And you'll notice in the Roland Madonna by Jan van Eyck, there is uh, an opening, uh, three arches with columns in between. Uh, and through that, you see this landscape. And the landscape has uh, a river in the middle. And on one side, you have vineyards and houses. On the other side, you pretty much have churches. And then sort of the middle ground, if you will, uh, closer to the Virgin and Rolin, uh, you see a kind of parapet or the, maybe the, you know, the edge that you're looking down on the river. And there are two figures, a, a man wearing a, a black turban and a man wearing a red turban. And you know, they're gazing on the scene. Okay, let's go over and look and see how did this influence Roger van der Weyden. Well, Roger also has two figures, one on either side. In this case, it's not uh, the patron and the saint, it's the Virgin Mary. And of course, the saint uh, kneeling on the other side. But when you look at the background, he doesn't have arches, but he does have a three-part opening with a lintel running across the top. And we see a very similar landscape in that it has a river running through the middle. And we can see uh, you know, houses on either side. It's not uh, identical details at all. And then you have this uh, kind of parapet uh, with the crenellated wall. And uh, instead of two men, we see a man and a woman uh, with their backs to us, you know, looking off to the scene. So he's borrowed that landscape setting, uh, made a lot of changes, but we can still see um, you know, sort of the basic composition. Changed and adapted by Roger van der Weyden. Now, I said that people like to borrow uh, compositions by Roger van der Weyden. Uh, they would copy them. And one of the interesting things about this painting of St. Luke is that there are actually four versions of it. The one in Boston, there's one in Munich, one in Bruges, uh, and one in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg which has been uh, cut down a little bit. Uh, the top of it seems to have been cut off. So one of the questions was, well, you know, is one of these by Roger van der Weyden and then the others are all followers? Which, which one's the first one? Which one's the one by the master? It used to be that people would say, oh, it's the one in Munich. That's the best quality. Well, what happened was they cleaned the painting in Boston, and they found that it was a very high quality, uh, you know, when the dirt and the overpaints were removed. And another thing they did was use infrared reflectography. This is the method of using these very long wavelengths 
beyond the infrared, uh, to examine a painting and to pick up the carbon-based underdrawings. And when they did that, and here you see a detail of uh, St. Luke, uh, you can see that there's you know, all this changes that have been made. Um, you know, if you look at the reflecting ramp, it looks like there's two eyes. Actually, Roger van der Weyden has changed the placement of the eye. You're picking up the eye where it is now on the painting surface, but also where he drew it. And, you know, there are many other changes in the painting of St. Luke and of the whole painting. Now, we call these pentimenti, which is Italian for thoughts. You might think of them as first thoughts, uh, you know, the first ideas that are put down uh, on the painting. And then, of course, the artist will make changes in them as he paints the final version. You wouldn't see that in a copy. In a copy, they would be copying what was on the painting surface. So this makes it clear that the painting in Boston is the original painting by Roger van der Weyden. You have both the extremely high quality, the similarity to other works by Roger van der Weyden, and you can see his pentimenti or his underdrawing and all of the changes. Now you see here's the Christ child and you can see that um, someone to make it clear what all of these changes are has drawn some of them out. The hand has been changed, the position of the child has been changed. Um, you know, there's just a lot of changes going Right on there. I also wanted to show you just some details of this. You know, we talk about the Netherlandish naturalistic details. On Mary's throne or bench, uh, there's a carving of Adam and Eve with Eve taking uh, the forbidden fruit from the serpent who has a female head um, and that headdress that's known as the horned uh, headdress, we call it that. Uh, and then there's this beautiful scene of uh, a little Flemish town. Adam and Eve are there, of course, uh, because you know Christ came to save mankind from the sin of Adam and Eve. And the town is there to provide a vista, uh, to provide, uh, you know, what, uh, making it more making it more realistic, making it more uh, lively, as though this were happening in a, a contemporary city. Well, sometimes Roger van der Weyden has you know, details in the background um, that give you a landscape or an interior setting, but sometimes it's a more stark background. This is a very, very large diptych, uh, two panels. Uh, today it's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And you can see that they're showing the crucifixion, not as the historical event when you have, you know, uh, all the soldiers who are tormenting Christ and all the followers of Christ, but as an occasion for devotion. And he has reduced it to Christ, Mary, and John. And instead of placing it um, against, say, a landscape background or a stormy sky, he's placed these figures against a, a kind of gray wall with red cloths of honor behind them. Uh, you would have, for say, when the Duke uh, is enthroned, you know, you would have a cloth of honor behind him. And this uh, carries over into uh, religious painting because sacred figures, as you'll remember with Jan van Eyck's Get Older piece, sacred figures would have uh, cloths of honor behind them. In this case, uh, it's red, and that sets off the pale figures. Uh, Christ's loins cloth swirls in a beautiful arabesque. And John and Mary, who traditionally wear, John wears um, a, a bright red and uh, Mary usually wears blue. Those are their colors that are associated with them. They're given a very, very pale version of those colors. Um, just the 
The shadows are this pale, we would say pink, this pale light red, and this pale blue. So they're not grisaille, but they become sort of out of the historical context and into a spiritual realm, as it were, as though this is a timeless event. And you'll see that the two two panels are intimately connected. Uh, the edge of Mary's garment extends into the panel of Christ. Uh, and of course, the uh, wall and the ground line uh, continues into both panels. Now, some of you may be wondering why there is a skull and a bone uh, beneath the cross of Christ. There's two reasons for that. One, the place where Christ was crucified was called Golgotha. The Bible tells us that the place where Christ was crucified was Golgotha. And the name Golgotha means the place of the skull. But there's another reason. There was a long medieval we would call it a legend again, but a long story about where the wood of the cross came from. And part of that legend was the idea that Adam was buried in the very place that later Christ would be crucified. So they often call this the skull of Adam. So Adam who brought sin and death into the world, it's the very place of his burial on which the Redeemer redeems mankind from sin and death. Kind of nice parallelism of place. Christ's death brings eternal life. Now, where did Roger van der Weyden get that idea of having a wall and a cloth of honor? Maybe he came up with it on his own. But there's a possible influence. We do know that in the year 1450, Roger van der Weyden went down to Italy. He went to Rome on a pilgrimage. That was the Jubilee year. In other words, it was a special year for special ceremonies. And the Pope offered indulgences for people who made the journey to Rome, uh, said the proper prayers with the proper attitude in uh, the places assigned. Um, Roger may have been making the journey as a pious person uh, for indulgences for himself. It's also been suggested that his daughter had recently died, and uh, you can make proxy pilgrimages. You can get merits uh, by going on pilgrimage uh, for other people, and that possibly um, he was doing this in part for his uh, daughter's, uh, the well-being of her soul. In any case, uh, for whatever he went uh, down to Rome, we also know that he passed through Florence. And while he was in Florence, uh, he seems to have seen some paintings by Fra Angelico and painted some paintings uh, for the Medici family. Now, one of these paintings um, seems to be based in part on a, another painting by Fra Angelico, and, and that's the Uffizi. But this is a painting by Fra Angelico. It is a fresco or a wall painting uh, in the Dominican um, monastery of San Marco in Venice. And as you can see, it is um, a painting of the mocking of Christ, but in a kind of symbolic sense. You have a platform with Christ being seated, uh, blindfolded, mocked, not by people, but by sort of the heads of these people uh, spitting at him and uh, disembodied hands um, hitting him and beating him uh, with staves. And then you have two figures below, and uh, these are uh, saints. So you see uh, Saint Dominique, for example. Uh, they are meditating on the mocking of Christ. So once again, this is a kind of devotional image. It would be in the cells of one of the uh, monks, or the, excuse me, one of the friars, uh, the Dominican friars. And what Fra Angelico has done 
is place this timeless scene uh, what you know the the idea of the the meditation what uh, these two saints are thinking um, it's placed against a gray wall with a cloth of honor hanging behind it uh, once again taking it out of the historical time and place or the narrative time and place and making it an image for devotion and once again when we look at the Philadelphia um, Christ on the cross we see Mary collapsing she's holding her hands you can see it as a prayer gesture you can see it as wringing her hands but she's collapsed and John is burying her up and she suffers in her heart in her soul as Christ suffers on the cross and close up, you can also see the contrast of that rich red background to the pale colors of their garments. Now I'm going to talk to you about an artist who was born in Germany, but moved to Flanders. He lived in Bruges for about 30 years, and he died in 1494 in Bruges. His name was Hans Memlink. You can see that Hans is the German form of Jan, a name that in English would be John. Uh, so he's got the German uh, first name. And then we will spell his name today either M-E-M-L-I-N-G, or an alternate spelling would be M-E-M-L-I-N-C. Either one's fine. We have a document about uh, Hans Memling when he becomes a citizen of Bruges. And it tells us where he was born, in the town of Zelligenstadt, which is actually still, it's a lovely town uh, in, uh, along the Main River uh, in about 20, 25 kilometers from uh, Frankfurt. He settled in Bruges in January of 1465, which is when he became a citizen. And he died in Bruges, as we said, in 1494. We don't know his birthday. Or it's, we, don't know, we don't know his birth date. Um, we know it has to be no later than January of 1440. And the reason for that is the age of majority in Bruges was 25 years old. So when he pays his citizenship fee to become a citizen of Bruges, he has to be at least 25 years old. So that's all we know. <laughs> um, he probably was either a student or an assistant, or, or both, uh, to Roger van der Weyden. We know this from a couple of ways. Uh, one is that he, he was one of the artists who adopted and adapted Roger van der Weyden's compositions to his own uh, interpretations. But these are paintings from Roger's complete career. Uh, we know where some of them were. Uh, we know when some of them were created. and. They're from such a wide range of time that Memlich couldn't possibly have been in the studio, you know, during Roger's entire career. Um, and could he have possibly gone to all of these different places where the actual finished paintings were? More likely, he had access to workshop drawings. We believe that all painters kept, we used to call it a pattern book. It doesn't have to be a book. Uh, it could be a portfolio. It could be a box. It could be a chest. But a place where they kept uh, patterns, drawings that they had made, which they then would reuse. And their students would learn by copying their patterns. The other thing is that Molly Ferries has done a study of Memling's underdrawings and finds that in his earlier work, his technique of drawing is similar to Roger van der Weyden's technique of drawing. Of course, he develops in his own way, and you know we saw some of those very scribbly underdrawings. Um, 
if an artist wasn't in Roger's workshop, why would he be doing the underdrawings in the same way? Hans Mamlik is known for these ideal, graceful, serene figures. They have naturalistic detail, but the Madonna, for example, usually has this beautiful face. Uh, often he uses landscape backgrounds, and he didn't invent the landscape background, but he certainly popularizes it in the background of sacred uh, in the background of sacred figures, and also in the background of portraiture. He's also well known for his portraits. Um, if you want to look very dignified and very devout, get Hans Memling to paint your portrait. Uh, he'll make you look better, perhaps, uh, without undue flattery, but just simply by making the light diffuse. So it's a softer lighting. We're looking at a diptych by Memling. A diptych is a two-panel painting, and on one side of the painting, we see the Virgin and Child. On the other side of the painting, we see a portrait of a person in prayer, looking toward the Virgin and Child. Now, we have in the background um, family crest, uh, and in the window uh, behind the man, uh, you can see a stained glass window showing St. Martin dividing his cloak with the beggar. So we know that this is Martin von Nevenhove. Um, and this is a very prominent family in Bruges. In fact, uh, about 10 years later, Martin became the mayor of Bruges. The painting is dated on the frame, 1487, and gives the donor's name and age. Uh, the artist is not named here. Uh, Memlik is named on two paintings whose frame has survived, but this is not one of them. So we have... Uh, the donor at age 23. This is what is called a devotional diptych. And you would have on one side the sacred figure, usually the virgin and child, and then on the other side you would have the person praying to it. So essentially he's shown in perpetual prayer. His image continually prays to the virgin and child. Uh, this was a type of devotional image that was invented by Roger van der Weyden. And here is one of the examples uh, that comes closest to this painting by Memlink. Uh, because in this case, you have a uh, frontal virgin. You see her whole face. Uh, and uh, the child, who is, as you can see, is blessing. And the, uh, the person who is praying uh, on the other side. But you'll also notice that there's no background. There's no setting. Uh, they're just simply against a, a, a dark or colored background. Memlink takes this idea of the devotional diptych and creates a cohesive, believable space. In this case, it's as though the Virgin has appeared in the chamber of Martin von Nevenhoven. Martin is saying his devotions, he's saying the little office of the Virgin, and there the object of his devotion, you know, can be seen. Can he see it? Or can what just we see it? Uh, certainly whoever is looking at the painting can see it. You'll notice that um, Martin's eyes look a little unfocused, like what Chancellor Rollins did in uh, Jan van Eyck's role in Madonna. And we think that this suggests that he's having a kind of inward vision, or is portrayed that way, we should say. You might notice that behind the Virgin, and a little bit over the shoulder of Martin, uh, you can see beautiful landscapes uh, with this winding road and 
you know, sort of hazy mountains in the distance. Behind Martin, uh, it's actually a place in Rouge. Uh, today it's called the Mini Water, the Lake of Love, uh, but it actually was a place uh, where they uh, had a crane and would unload goods. It's very beautiful today, actually. Okay, let's look a little closer. Behind the Virgin, you see one of these convex mirrors. Uh, and we remember that from the Arnolfini double portrait. And for all we know, Jan van Eyck could have used that mirror in other paintings, maybe a painting to the Virgin Mary. One of Mary's titles is the Speculum Sine Macula, the mirror without spot. So here it's visualized. But it also creates a kind of merger of the spiritual and the physical world. Because in that mirror, we see not only the silhouette of Martin von Nevenhoven, but we also see the back of the Virgin Mary as though she is tangibly present in the chamber of the donor. So here are many of the things that we talk about when we um, talk about Hans Memling's paintings. We see this ideal Virgin Mary with the tender love for the Christ child. Um, if Roger van der Weyden was so good about painting the suffering of Christ and his followers, Memlink is excellent in painting the love of the Virgin Mary. We see naturalistic details like the jewels, the stained glass, um, the brocade on the pillow, and, and of course the mirror. We see the dignity of Martin von Nevenhoven. Uh, you know, he is shown as a very devout person. And then, of course, Memling's also known for these beautiful and serene landscapes, which we can see through the window. Um, let me show you some of the details here. Uh, here is that uh, detail of the stained glass window behind Martin. Uh, is a uh, a painting of a stained glass window of the donor's patron saint, Saint Martin of Tours. Part of his legend is that he was um, very charitable uh, when there was a cold beggar. Uh, he took uh, his sword and cut his cloak in half so that the beggar could have it. Um, and then you see, and this is actually behind the Virgin in the paintings, the coats of arm of the Navenhoven family. And you see this little roundel of a, a sort of a hand of God uh, uh, sprinkling uh, seeds on the ground and they're growing up with the sun and the rain. Uh, the name Navenhove means new garden. So that's what's portrayed there. And you see Mary offering an apple to the Christ child. Um, there's a couple of means for this. Uh, mostly you'll see people saying, aha, the apple represents the forbidden fruit. And so this is a reference to Christ as the new Adam who redeems the sin of the first Adam. And I'm sure that's true. Um, I've also written a paper in which I suggest that there's another possible meaning, that Christ is the fruit of Mary's womb. Uh, and in the prayer of the Ave, um, it says, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, let's take a little closer look at Martin von Nevenhoven. We said he's praying, and he has this book open in front of him. Well, what book would he be using? A book of hours. You can't read the letters. They're sort of fake letters. But the most likely book would be the Little Office of the Virgin in the Book of Hours. So he's saying his prayers to the Virgin and the object of his devotion appears in front of him. Uh, we said that, uh, you know, not every person could have a vision of the saints or of uh, Mary or Christ. 
but you can have an artist paint it for you. And certainly that's what Memlink has done. Now, if you look really closely at the reproduction, you're going to be able to see what looks kind of like some blue lines on Martin's hand and through the window. Actually, with the years, the layers of paint have become thin enough that we can actually see the underdrawing with the visible eye. You can do even more with infrared reflectography, uh, but you can see this. And you can see, you know, it's kind of scribbly, and he's showing the shading, and he's enlarged the fingers. You can see he just sort of sketched. Here's, I'm going to put the thumb somewhere around here, and he's enlarged it. Uh, the arm was a little thinner. He's enlarged it. And the other thing is that through the window, you can see some of these straight lines. Memlik seems to be creating a kind of perspective diagram. And you'll notice that he has oblique lines in the window frame on the side of Martin von Nevenhoven. And if you extend these perspective lines, we find that the focal point is the Virgin Mary. So both what physically and spiritually, uh, Memlink focuses in on Mary. And it also shows that he's one of these very innovative artists who's now starting to use linear perspective. And it also shows that he's one of these innovative artists who in Northern Europe is starting to use linear perspective.